My name is Rick Bischoff. I am the Vice President of Enrollment at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Case Western Reserve is the fourth stop on my admissions career thus far. I like to be a place a little while and get out of town before they figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I, I started at my alma mater, McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, very traditional small liberal arts college. I went to the University of Chicago from there where I spent seven years. Uh, University of Chicago is kind of a big liberal arts college in a kind of large research university setting. From there, I then spent five years in Pasadena, California. You would think that was a great career move. I was, at, I was the director of admissions at Caltech. Uh, spent five years there, and then my family got the opportunity to move to Cleveland, Ohio. And we may have been the only family in Pasadena who said, really? Uh, and we're excited about the move, and I've now been here for five years. Uh, and if you don't know Caltech, it is a very small. Uh, and it's small, if you, even if you think you know it's small, it's probably smaller than you think it is. Uh, 900 undergraduates uh, in a incredibly powerful uh, science and engineering research institution uh, was the easiest job in America, an entering class of 225 students every year. Uh, and now I'm at Case Western Reserve. Um, what, what I've been asked to talk about in this session is kind of what happens after students submit their applications. You know, what goes on on the college side? Uh, these days, mostly applications are digital. You click submit. And then for students and parents, often there's a great mystery as to what goes on. What I want you to listen to, how many of you have, how many of you have high school seniors who are in the midst of this? Okay, juniors, okay. sophomores, freshmen, middle schoolers, Okay, and some of you clearly have more than one child. <laughs> I see your hands going up. So th there are two things I want you to listen for, kind of as I talk about what happens. Because ju just telling you what we do isn't that 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 useful. Um, but there are kind of two threads here. One, particularly if you have younger children, you know, what are the things that they can be doing that are going to make them more competitive in the admissions process? And the second thing to listen for as I talk, and I'll certainly leave time for questions, uh, is what, what are those things that a student can do when it, when it comes to submitting an application to present themselves in the best possible way? I think those are the two, the two threads that will be useful here. And what, what I, it, I'm going to make an assumption. Uh, I'm going to talk about you know, kind of the generic admissions process. So it actually works this way nowhere. Uh, but it, it's, it's a good description of the kinds of ways in which an admissions office would, would, would evaluate applications. However, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk very specifically about those institutions that, you know, A, have choices in terms of who they offer admission to, and institutions that actually read applications. Uh, you will look at some institutions and they will say if you have you know, this GPA and this test score, you know, you are admitted. Yeah, that's not what I'm talking about, because that's actually really easy. You know, get the test score, get the GPA, everything's fabulous. Uh, but in the world of what we call selective admissions, uh, we have more qualified applicants than we need to admit in order to enroll the size class that we want. And what that means is we get to make choices <coughs> about the kinds of students, the kinds of class that enrolls. And we have, in my world, all kinds of demands on us. And that's kind of the first thing to think about is, you know, let me be very clear, this is not about fairness in terms of, you know, fairness to your sons and daughters. This is not about a reward for all of their hard work. Every admissions office in the country, it is about bringing in the class that that institution wants. And some things may seem more fair than others, but every person in my role starts with kind of the, the internal pressures of their own community and what it is that that campus wants. In my case, I have a business school, a nursing school, a college of arts and sciences, and an engineering school. If I enroll a class with zero nurses, the nursing dean, and she's not very big, but she's very tough, uh, will be in my office because her faculty will have no students to teach. So I've got to balance those 
kinds of things. Uh, many institutions have financial pressures. And uh, Dr. McHugh may have talked about some institutions are need blind where they don't care about how much money a family can afford to pay. Other institutions will think about how much revenue is this family going to bring as, as they make admissions decisions. We may have pressures in terms of you know, geographic composition. You know, do we want all of our students to be from Ohio? It's a less interesting place to our students. Or do we want students from all over the country, all around the world? Uh, so th those are just a handful of the kinds of things. You know, if you need musicians, oh, we have those little athletic programs. And even Division three institutions, you need athletes on campus. Winning is more fun than losing. Uh, and so you've got all of these pressures. And typically what is going to happen, student submits the application, all of the pieces come in. And these days, uh, with electronic applications, often the student's part of the application is the last thing that is electronically up there in the cloud. And so it's amazing because these days, students submits the application, very often everything is there already. And so we can move, move right on to evaluation. Virtually every admissions office is going to have some kind of evaluation rubric. And as you're out visiting colleges, you should ask that question. You know, can, can, can you give me a sense of you know, what your evaluation rubric is? Are there different things that you are rating in the application? Do not tell them that Rick Bischoff told you to ask, uh, because they will not let me into the meeting next time. Uh, but I think that's a fair question, and it will get at kind of what that institution values in the process. Uh, very typically, you know, a very generic process uh, is going to look broadly at kind of two kinds of characteristics. <clears throat> you know, academic characteristics of the student and the kind of extracurricular community characteristics of that student and what they're going to bring. The more residential an institution is, the more important those extracurricular and community characteristics are going to be in, in that decision making. Because we have to think about every student that we offer admission to is going to be somebody's roommate. They're going to live across the hall. We want them, if we're a residential community, we want them involved in activities because I have political organizations, religious organizations, community service organizations, all of those that need people uh, to be engaged. We really do read the applications. And very typically, an application is going to be read at least twice. There, there might be some exceptions in, in admissions office, but as I talk to my colleagues and hear them describe their admissions process, typically an application is going to be, be read twice because uh, it's high stakes from the standpoint of students and parents. We understand that. And the thing that terrifies us most is that we make a mistake. And not that we admit somebody who we shouldn't have admitted, but that we don't admit somebody who should have been admitted. That's what keeps us up at night, is that we miss those students. It is unusual in selective admissions offices for an application not to be read, for them to be for there to be some kind of statistical cut. Would be would be highly unusual for that to be the case. And parents and students are all like, come on. You know, really, you know, below a certain test score, below a certain GPA, no. Uh, even when I was the director of admissions at Caltech, in that case, I read the very bottom of the applicant pool myself because I was terrified that we would miss. The faculty there would say, you know, we don't want to miss the next Richard Feynman, very, very famous physicist uh, who's a Caltech faculty member. Um, so, you know, they're going to be read. Uh, we read everything. You know, we, 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 we read what the student writes, we read their essay, we read the recommendations, uh, we're looking at transcripts, we're looking at extracurricular activities. And I think if parents were in the room, and if you could hear us talking about students and the review process, I think you'd be really surprised at the lack of superficiality in the process. It's not that we're going through and counting, oh, this student is involved in you know, 12 extracurricular activities, you know, and 12 is better than six. That's not what we're doing. We're really reading applications, look, looking at what the student tells us, 
looking at what recommendations are telling us about the kinds of things that students are involved in, and trying to understand, okay, who is this student? What is their life like? And then the very important question, and what are they going to bring here? And that's that part where I say, you know, this isn't a reward for all their hard work. You know, it's really about, and you know, how does this translate into life in our community? What are they going to bring? Uh, you know, somebody who, is, who has substantial engagement in their community and is involved in the things that are going on after school, that student is going to be more appealing to us than the student who is home by 3.30 playing video games every afternoon. Because they're going to be more likely to come to our community and, and, and become involved. Uh, I think you would be surprised at the depth of the conversation around academics in an application. Uh, we're not just looking at GPAs and test scores. Uh, test scores by themselves are absolutely useless. It's when you have test scores and you have a transcript and you can see the courses that a student has taken, you can see their pattern over time. I won't ask for a show of hands, but somebody in this room has a boy who in ninth grade, um, their achievement was less than they were capable of. Don't, don't raise your hand. Uh, you can't have this many people in a room without having that student. Uh, we understand that. We're not admitting ninth graders. Our, que our question isn't, oh gee, you know, let's line all the students up with the best GPAs and the best test scores and let's admit them. We're looking at students who are trying to say, okay, who's this student going to be in our classroom? And when we're reading recommendations, we're really reading recommendations and trying to understand who, not just, oh, this is a fine student. You know, they turn their homework in and they study for their tests. What do they contribute in the classroom? Who our faculty want to teach? And, you know, we, we, I mean, it's shocking how much teacher recommendations tell us about what a student contributes to the classroom. And that's important to us. Uh, there, are lots of, there are lots of ways to get good grades. You know, there are students, nobody's child in this room, but there are students who get good grades and contribute nothing to the intellectual community. How exciting is that to a faculty member on my campus? Not that much. Uh, so we're really, you know, it, the, the depth of the conversation I think would surprise people. Typically what's going to happen, you're going to read the application once, it is then going to get passed on to a second reader who is going to read that application again. Very commonly, that application will then go to a third reader who is a senior member of the staff. You always want a set of senior eyes on an application. Uh, we hire lots of 22-year-olds uh, because they work for not a lot of money. Uh, they're smart, they're ambitious, they love to travel. Uh, they make great admissions counselors. But they don't have the depth of experience. You know, they haven't visited, I should count up someday, how many high schools I've visited across the country. Um, I, I, I can't imagine I haven't been in more than a thousand high schools. Uh, you learn something. Uh, you learn things over time about curricula, about communities, the kinds of activities that, that are important in those communities. And then, and here's where kind of different processes will diverge wildly. Um, you will have some processes where that third reader will render a decision. Based on the two, the two evaluations, they'll adjudicate any discrepancies between the reads, and then they'll make a decision as to whether that student should be admitted, be placed on the waiting list, or be denied. Some processes, uh, that third reader might make decisions on the ends. Those students who are very clearly going to be offered admission, and those students who very clearly are not going to be offered admission. And then that middle group uh, might go to committee, which would be the, uh, you know, some representation of what you would see in the movies about, you know, what admissions committee is. I promise for those institutions who do committee, they are never dressed as well as they are in the movies. And the room in which we do committee is never as distinguished as the rooms they show in the movies. Uh, and there, uh, you know, if, if, if an institution does committee, that is where they're going to sit and they're going to have an admissions counselor present an application. Uh, they'll talk about it. They might talk about it for, for five minutes. 
I've been in conversations where we've talked about candidates for 45 minutes or an hour and then taken a break and come back uh, because we wanted another piece of information. Because ultimately we're going to take as much time as it takes to come to what we believe is a good decision. Again, not a fair decision, not a right decision, but a good decision, uh, which is, which is what, we, what we work for. Uh, so very broadly, you know, that, that's what goes on. A couple of things very specifically um, in, in terms of, first, for those of you who have younger students, the single most important thing that you can do in terms of preparing for the college process is encourage your children to be involved. I don't care what they're involved in. They should be involved in things that they care about. I love <coughs> listening to you know, all of the talking heads who aren't admissions people <coughs> tell you, you know, what colleges are really looking for. And I love, my favorite is leadership. Yeah, you know, how many of you have heard that colleges, you know, really respond to leadership? Could you imagine if every student on our campus was a leader? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing would get done. <laughs> I don't need everybody to be a leader. I need leaders in, in an entering class. The other one I love is community service. You know, if you don't have community service, you're not going to college. Uh, I don't need everybody to do community service. I need some people to do community service. And so this mythical, you know, kind of well-rounded student who the athlete does service, they're a leader, uh, they do all of these amazing things, they, you know, were the star of the school musical, and oh, by the way, they're, you know, part of a national dance troupe. I mean, if that's who your child is, awesome. But that's not who you're trying to create. Uh, you know, we get your children when they're typically, you know, 17 or 18 years old. And people like me do this kind of work because we actually like 17 and 18 year olds. And we love college students. I get up every morning and go to work on college campus. And I've done that now for 25 years, which is pretty awesome. And do you know college students are a little quirky, a little blacky, their sense of humor is a little shock. You know, you know this, but so often parents as you start through the process, you, you want your kids to present like they're 45. <laughs> 45 is bored. <laughs> Sorry, it is. And one of the things, you know, very concrete thing in terms of writing the best application, when it comes to a student's college essay, stay away from it. Stay away. And somebody in here is a professional writer and you think I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm especially talking to you. Because what parents do is you suck the quirkiness. You suck what's interesting. Because you all think, well, you know, I love my child. I know this about them. But they won't appreciate it. You know, th that's what we're looking for. You know, we're, we're looking for that authenticity. We're looking for something that helps us understand who the student is. We're looking for something that connects to what teachers and counselors are going to be telling us about the students. I'm going to be quiet and answer some questions. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering if um, looking at the social media of the students applying is any part of the admissions process at any colleges? There are, at any colleges, or yes. Many. Uh, at, at any colleges, yes. There are colleges that will say, yeah, we reserve the right to go look at social media and see what you're up to. Is that normal? Is it something that happens? It's an normal? incredible range. You will have places that will say, yes, we do that. And then you will have places like Case Western Reserve where we tell our staff you are not allowed to go to social media. Can we find out which ones do that and which don't? You, you should ask that question. And, and any place that goes, well, um, that's yes. <laughs> Just to be clear. Yes. What, um, what's the difference between college placement and AP classes in high school? Um, so, Every place has a different kind of curriculum and a way of label, labeling things. Um, in, you know, so you know, there's kind of AP International Baccalaureate. We don't care. We don't care whether you're AP IB. We don't care. Some schools don't have AP or IB, but they have different levels within their curriculum, and they give us information to understand which courses are, are the most rigorous. Typically, you know, we'll see a lot of schools that have you know kind of an AP track in the curriculum and then either an honor, honors or you know, kind of a college ready track that they might call you know, something else. We are looking at levels of curriculum. 
And depending on the institution, depending on how competitive it is, it matters, you know, in an enormous in an enormous way. And they're going to look and, and you know at the very competitive places. They're looking, and if, and if a student is not taking, you know, a, as rigorous a curriculum as is reasonably possible in that school community, they're not going to be competitive. Most places, you know, are going to be more like you know Case Western Reserve, where, yeah, we want to see that you're pushing yourself. But I actually prefer students who aren't doing everything. They tend to do the other stuff better. And you know, we're looking to see, is this student prepared? Now, you know, you, you have a student who wants to do engineering, you know, and you know, they're finishing in Algebra 2. Uh, that doesn't align very well with the engineering curriculum at most places. You know, so we're, we're making those kinds of nuanced distinctions there. There was a hand, yes. Case, I um, demonstrated interest in the university, and how can you tell? Well, um, oh wait, that means yes. Uh, uh, this year, for the first time, demonstrated interest matter. I, uh, you know, we said, and, and the reason demonstrated interest matters to schools like us is when I have lots of choices, I have lots of choices of very high ability, very engaged students. If I can choose the ones who I think know us well and are really paying attention to us, I think it's going to help me build a better community. Ask the question. You know, when you're visiting colleges, ask the question. And again, if the answer is well, that means yes. Uh, you know, any hesitation from the admissions counselor, you know, yes is what they mean by that, that answer. And I know Dr. McHugh talked about that a little bit. You need to visit campuses. You need to show up at information sessions that happen here in the Cleveland area. If you can do an interview with a law, you need to do that. Uh, it makes a difference. How does that play out for such a high international intake? I mean, they can do demonstrated interest. That's probably There is no student, well, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. You know, the admissions process for any given student, different things are going to be more important than others. And so, yes, if I have a, if I have a student, I, I visited a school in Flecken, Norway. Anybody ever been to Flecken? I do not expect those students to have visited. On the other hand, when I visited Flaca, I interviewed students. I'm going to be more inclined to like the students I interviewed in that case because they took the time to invest something. So there are different ways that it plays out, different things that you look for. Just like you know, a student from Los Angeles, I might look at the kinds of ways that they would demonstrate interest differently than somebody who's 20 miles from my university. You mentioned a few times that you like students to be involved. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some examples? Uh, what, what we are looking for is sustained, real involvement. Do not worry about how long that list is. Long list, when, when I look at that long list, I the first thing I do is I make a pass and I say, how much time do these things take? And then I look at it and say, and how many years have they been doing this thing? And if it's a joiner, I mean, we're not dumb. You know, you join six activities fall of your senior year. <laughs> I know what's going on. So I don't care what students do. You know, if a student's an athlete, great. If they're a musician, terrific. Dancer, love dancers. Uh, community service, I, I don't care what they do. But do something. Do something you care about. You know, and, and don't micromanage your kids' activities, particularly those of you with younger activities. But if you had a child, I have a 12-year-old boy, so I'm reliving seventh grade all over again. You know, coming home and being on the couch at 3:30 in the afternoon and playing video games, no, yeah, no. And what we say, we don't care what you do, but you're not doing that. What would you like to do? Uh, and then we support those things that he that he likes. One more, and then I think that was our bell. Yes. I think like over the last 15 years, the, the year-round clubs for, for athletes, they really, you know, they start them really young, and there's really no time to do anything. My kids are all 20 hours right. a week in their sport, and so to get involved in other things that they're interested in, they just don't have the time. They, they got to have leadership. They got to have service. They got to be doing music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go to college. No, and, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we're doing.